This is a chaconne from Francois Couperin, the early 18th century great composer of keyboard music. Almost exclusively he wrote for harpsichord. He wrote volumes of wonderful little pieces. This one called La Favorite. This is the most ornate of the chaconnes we have because uh, French music throughout much of the 16th and 17th and early 18th century is highly ornamented. These are really the decorative arts.
Hi, my name is Arnie Tanimoto, and I play the viola da gamba. The viola da gamba is a family of instruments, kind of like the violin and the recorder and the lute. And although it looks kind of like a cello in terms of its size and construction, it's actually more closely related to the lute and the guitar. As you can see, it is fretted. These are just old strings that are tied on to the neck and fingerboard. Um, it has just about as many strings as a guitar and lute. Typically, uh, they have six strings. Mine happens to have an extra low seventh string. Uh, and the tuning is very similar to that of a lute and guitar, as opposed to a violin family instrument, which is tuned in fifths. So this instrument is tuned in D, so its top string is a D. We have a fourth down to A, and another fourth down to E, a third C, and then fourths all the way down, G. But unlike the lute and guitar, the viola da gamba is played with a bow. Uh, although you might notice that the bow hold is slightly different from that of a violin or cello, the viola da gamba bow hold is what we call an underhand bow hold, where one manipulates the hair rather than the stick of the bow. It's not better or worse, it's just a little different. And because of the nature of this instrument and with the bow and the tuning and the frets, it's very resonant and it can play chords, so it's very versatile. But you can also play bass lines to accompany the voice or other instruments like the violin. But you can also play melodies. It was an instrument that was popular throughout the Renaissance, the Baroque, and into the early classical era, where it sort of died out because the violin and cello became so popular, and concerts moved from small rooms and churches to big concert halls, where the instrument just could not really uh, fill up in terms of volume. It also had this socioeconomic uh, relation with the aristocracy along with instruments like the harpsichord and the lute, and we all know what happened in places like France at the end of the 18th century. So luckily this instrument has been revived in the 20th century and it's alive and well.
encenque y de sabor el palenque con la pastora lizarda la mezquina doña albarda de poco pasa Gonzalo y un ciego dio con un palo tras de la braga lindora y la fama lo pregona a la vida divina mira mamá no se achacora mira mamá no se achacora a la vida divina executive director of the American Classical Orchestra, and I'm so glad you could be with us tonight. 
Please stay tuned for a live Q&A with Maestro Thomas Crawford and Guadalupe Parasa, our vocal soloist who just sang so elegantly this evening. It immediately follows. For me, one of the greatest joys of this season has been to be there in person and watch as the musicians you have just seen and heard performed together at historic Harlem Parish. The excitement the musicians shared as they made their music together for the first time since spring was palpable. Yes, they lamented. They also danced. They filled the air with their love of music. Please help us continue to support our musicians as they bring you music to live by, music that celebrates life, by donating to the American Classical Orchestra. To donate, look beneath the video you are watching for the Support ACO button, or check chat, or click on the Support ACO button you'll find on at the end of any of the emails we have sent recently and on anything that we send as follow-up. And remember, any amount that you can give will be greatly appreciated. Your support means our future. Thank you for listening, and thank you for experiencing the performances of, our, of classical music by our outstanding musicians played on period instruments. That's what the American Classical Orchestra is all about. Now, Maestro Crawford and Guadalupe Parasa Amanda? Yes, hi, David. Uh, thank you so much for those words. Um, and I'd, I'd like to echo your thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, the Chacon Project, as you may have um, notice from David's comments has been a real labor of love for us at ACO and we were so pleased and proud to be able to bring these musicians together for this project and I would um, like to welcome now uh, our artistic director Thomas Crawford and our mezzo soloist for the Chacon project Guadalupe Parasa. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, Tom Maybe you could just tell us, what is it about the Chacon that attracted you to make a program solely of Chacons? I think for me, it was the variety. We've already heard this variety and there's even more coming on Friday. Um, it's a dance and most dances are pretty predictable. You know, the, the bourre, uh, the gavotte, any of these dances from the 17th, 18th century and um, but the Chacon somehow transformed and became taken in by great composers like Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, Henry Purcell, uh, Claudio Monteverdi that we have and they turned the Chacon into an art form of the great composers. Um, sometimes it's a slow lament, sometimes it's a, a, a street dance like the one we just heard from Juan Aranez. So I, I knew that we, I, I cast out to our musicians and said, give me some chacons that you might like to do on this program. This was a long time ago. I probably got a hundred. Wow. And Guadalupe, that brings me to you. Um, because you uh, chose these vocal works, I, I have to ask what drew you to these very different pieces? Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in, for being here with us. It's really an honor, a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Maestro Tom and Amanda, for this uh, wonderful event. Um, this is of some of my favorite music as well. I'm so happy to be part of this project. And through this, the elaboration of, of through the process of what we're doing, I came to discover a few works that uh, some of some of them I knew already. Some of them I, I discovered through the process, and uh, they seem to be connected in a way. Um, one of the very happy chacons that, that we heard is it's one of the original chacons, probably the first ever written. If maybe there were some, a few there in Italy, but probably one of the first ever, ever written chacons that had this rhythm and it's uh, originally a dance and it, had, it seems to have been transformed through the ostinato line and the repeating bass line into maybe some 
more dramatic uh, music that we did in the Laments. And this is like, just some of my favorite works. So this is, this is why I'm doing this. Um, this works and I would, if it's okay, I would like to welcome our listeners uh, from other uh, places in Spanish. Eh, buenas noches a todos, bienvenidos. Eh, nos gustaría saludar también a las comunidades que nos acompañan desde otros hemisferios en este evento tan especial. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros desde la distancia. Eh, a todos aquellos que quieran compartir con nosotros sus preguntas o sus comentarios con respecto a este evento, eh, escríbanos en el idioma de su elección y con mucho gusto los integraremos a esta plática con nuestro gran director musical y fundador de American Classical Orchestra, Thomas Crawford. Thank you so much, Guadalupe, um, for, the, for those greetings. And uh, we hope that everyone uh, feels confident in um, asking questions either in Spanish or English as we move along. There is a chat feature, as you might notice, um, of course, in Facebook, but also if you're um, joining us on our website and we welcome all of your questions. Um, Guadalupe, one question that has come in, for, uh, I think mostly directed towards you is, Um, what connection do you make between um, the Aranas and flamenco music? The, Aran the Aranas, uh, Juan Aranas, is a very interesting piece. It has a lot of uh, different influences. And so what the theory is, and there, there are a lot of uh, theories about this piece, it's, it's a very short piece of music that has so much into it. And this is one of the first ever written out Uh, chacons, but it doesn't mean that they haven't been played before, right? So they were probably played before for a long time, and they have an influence uh, of other countries. So this is a moment in which maybe some unfortunate things of like wars and, and slavery traffic were happening. But what happened in the positive outcome of all of this, uh, in my opinion, the positive outcome is that it it came into a lot of cultures interacting together. So what happens is that uh, rhythms from uh, Africa, rhythms from uh, native Latin America or uh, music from, from these places get together with uh, the culture that comes from Europe into, into America uh, in this moment. So this is uh, the time of Cervantes, the time of Juan, Juan Arañas, it's time when this happens. And um, So all of these uh, things start interacting and it turns into something else. So uh, the question was the relationship between this and the laments. Uh, flamenco. The flamenco, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, so there, here is this music from Spain uh, coming into, into Latin America, right? So there is an influence from all the dances that probably have also Arabic influence. So we have a lot of communities uh, sharing together. Uh, coming into one little piece of music here, written out, not little, but uh, short, I guess, <laughs> written out piece of music that has all these all this, uh, rhythm com combinations. And one of them, I'm sure, has something to do with flamenco. And maybe in a little bit, I can show you some uh, African music that is related with, with the rhythm that, that we hear here. Um, so there is some flamenco. There is so, so much more than that, too. I hope Great. that answers Thank the question. So Yeah, um, thank you. That uh, It'll be great to hear more from you about that. Um, Tom, uh, we have a question from Ajax and that's, um, is the Chacon specific to a certain time period? Oh, Tom, I think you're, you might be muted. Sorry. No, it's 350 years and counting. Um, this first one is from the late 1500s, and um, they, there are many written in the 20th century, and probably the 21st century. So this is a, an art form that continues uh, to thrive, that has thrived from the um, 16th century uh, till today. Um, that's great. Um, Guadalupe, since you have um, done all of this research, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that and, and draw those connections that you, um, you made with uh, various, this, these cross-cultural relationships. 
with the so Iranians. Is, yeah, I think this is the most interesting uh, part for me, the, the last piece that, that we performed, the, the Juan Arañez, the cross-cultural part. So this is a, uh, a piece of music that has seven verses written out, but there's probably a lot of uh, improvisation going on. So the singers are probably improvising verses that have a rhyme, that have a specific structure in this case each verse has eight syllables if you can count it they come on the upbeat and this is probably some uh, african influence here in this in this kind of rhythm um and it's people interacting as i as i said from from all over from all over the world the world and it also is explicitly said in the lyrics so some uh, some of the lyrics if you have the translation with you uh, these are seven verses that talk about a wedding. This is probably just a, a gossip in, a, apparently a gossip, but it might be some code, to, uh, criticism, uh, political criticism. I mean, he might have so many things to discover, but we have seven verses that talk about a wedding where people come and mingle and dance and they come out of there in their underwear. At the end, they come all dressed <laughs> up and they leave all, some of them in their underwear, some of them running away from some fight. Uh, so it's actually a satire, it's a, it's a very funny text, uh, but in the text we can see how the people that come to the wedding that we're talking about, some of them are communities from Africa, some of them are Roma communities, uh, some people from the royal family, so how they all get together and they bring the percussions and the rhythm, so uh, this just talks to us about the interaction that was going on of the, of the communities and how they created these artworks now that we can uh, perform and listen to. Um, and we uh, have one question that maybe Tom, you can answer, um, which is, uh, do you know what the Chacon dance is? The actual I do not. I think the closest we could come to what it must have looked like is what you just saw, what Lupe do. <laughs> it's got yeah, some, it's I got, I, I know this, it must have had use of hips. Yeah, that is, um, so I think that uh, one thing that you, you did a lot of research and in your research you found that um, some found the, the dance of the Chacon to be um, lascivious or to not be appropriate for polite society in uh, in Europe. So uh, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but uh, it, it uh, has evolved over the years into these various uh, art forms. Yeah. We did have some collaborators uh, who helped uh, put this together the best possible for uh, to help me put this together the best possible way and one of them is Magdalena Villaran. She is a dance, a Baroque dance specialist. So she has been researching uh, through pictures and through all kinds of uh, books, uh, all the archive that was left of how these dances could have been done. And she helped me find a few gestures and a few steps. And then uh, choreographer Emma Sofia Peraza helped me put it all together in one piece. Uh, but we do have a lot of, of research behind this, and we hope to be close to what it was. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, and I think, um, Justin, I'm wrapping up. I, um, if I don't see any other questions, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about um, Barbara Strozzi and um, your choice of her piece on this program. We, those of us who are uh, early music enthusiasts are familiar with Barbara Strozzi, but for some, she might not be as familiar. So perhaps you could tell her, us a little bit about her. Uh, me or Guadalupe? Um, I think Guadalupe. What, probably Guadalupe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, we're listening to a female composer and this is very special coming from the 17th century. It's very special no matter what. Uh, but coming from there, it's uh, very unusual since uh, the work of women has been repressed for so long. And especially in the past, it was almost impossible for women to publish her work. She 
we have quotes by Barbara Strozzi saying that she was afraid of slander if she would publish her work. So uh, I'm very happy that she had the courage to do it. And she was a very, very prolific composer and a very accomplished composer among the people around her. She was a contemporary of Monteverdi, actually. And uh, this lament has a, a dramatic, a tragic, um, a tragic text uh, that talks about uh, betrayal. It's, it's about romantic betrayal and romantic disappointment and how pain can be so deep when uh, through loss, right? So um, th this is, I think the most important part is that, that we have this very, very special piece and we can see the level and the, the quality of music that she left for us. Yeah, she was really quite extraordinary uh, for her time, but for any time. Dance with all the great composers. Um, well, um, thank you both so much. Uh, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us on this part of the program or on, uh, on the program as a whole? What a joy it was to perform again. It, this is all happening during the pandemic. If people see this film um, years and years from now. It has been a paralyzing period for musicians and especially singers who uh, were, you know, dubbed as super spreaders because of using the voice. So it's been a real joy to come back to live music making together. Yeah, thank you so much. This this has been a very, very special project at all levels, professionally and also personal levels. Uh, I can't uh, deny, I saw one of the comments and I cried so much because uh, somebody probably from Mexico mentioned this is a great gift, not only for every member of the audience, but also for Andres. And Andres is my father and my father passed away a couple of a couple of months ago and this music helped me survive that not only survive the pandemic but especially survive that and it helped me connect with this text of anguish and, and sorrow so uh it was very very special thank you for everyone who who is listening and i would like to acknowledge uh our colleagues who helped inform this project, especially uh, Juana Nañez, uh, in terms of how to find out what this text is about, because it's a confusing text. It's not that easy to deduct. It's very old Spanish, might not even be only Spanish. So it wasn't that easy for me to actually understand and come to conclusions of what this means. Thank you, uh, Salvador Marquez, who helped me with this, my wonderful colleague, Salvador Marquez. Thank you, uh, Baltasar Zuniga, maestros there, both wonderful singers. Um, Jorge Cosal uh, and uh, Roberto Rivadeneira, uh, the, the people who helped with the movement mentioned already Magdalena Villaran, Emma Sofia Peraza, and we had a wonderful percussionist uh, helping with this, uh, all the rhythm and choosing the percussion and choosing what to do with them, uh, Joseph Atlarios Vitella, and of course, uh, Michael Harris, who also played with us, was very helpful and um, putting this together and making it sound as close as possible to the cross-cultural uh, music that this is. So thank you so Beautiful. much. For yeah, thank you to all of, of those artists and collaborators. Thank you to you both. Thank you to all of our musicians who um, made this beautiful music with us and all the many people who made this possible. Um, we had one more question from Miriam and she was asking um, how, to, how we can further support artists and, um, uh, and ways to look for uh, early music and uh, concerts like this. And I think that um, there, I'll try to answer that uh, if I might. If I might, um, There are a few sites that uh, compile early music uh, concerts, uh, including Gotham Early Music Scene. Please also follow the artists that you enjoy, including American Classical Orchestra. We'd love it if you'd follow us. 
um, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and sign up for our mailing on our mailing list. Um, and you can support artists both directly and indirectly. Um, we are doing our very best to uh, pr present concerts throughout this season. We have a plan to do that and to uh, do that as safely as possible. And if you feel so inclined, please do consider supporting this project and our future projects for this season. Um, but do all, always keep artists in mind. Um, they are struggling, arts organizations are struggling and we value them so much uh, both for how they support the ACO, but how they keep us uh, you know, in the music and um, bring such joy to our lives. So um, thank you all. See you on Friday, I hope, see, uh, uh, at 7.30 for our, our second installment of the Chacon Project on all the same channels that uh, where, where you were able to access it today. And thank you and good night. Thank you so much.